let's record and share my screen and go to here. So there's some things about, I thought we were done with adhesives, but we weren't because <laughs> I forgot <laughs> these slides. Um, and this is really important. So I spent a lot of time going over the chemistry using the DocuCam and my pad and it's, I didn't switch back and forth. I, I didn't think about it actually, I just got carried away, but um, it would have taken so much time to switch back and forth and I'm glad I didn't. So the advantages here for urea formaldehyde. So <clears throat> these are things for you to know, it, it's cheap. It's the cheapest of the, of the big three, UFPF and PMDI. UF is always the cheapest <clears throat> and uh, it has a rapid cure. So that makes it even cheaper because you have a, a faster cycle time in the hot press, right? Because it cures rapidly. It has a light color, which PF does not, PF is dark. <clears throat> the limitations are that really the, the, so we went over the reaction, the reaction goes the best when you have an excess of formaldehyde. And we also talked about the reaction being reversible, that if you have high moisture content, the reaction can go backwards and you can <clears throat> basically undo the polymer that's formed and then that weakens the adhesive bond. So durability is an issue. So the big issue with urea formaldehyde, because it can go backwards, there's two reasons. The first one is to make the reaction go in the first place, you really want to have more formaldehyde than you need. This kind of, this is like, if you remember your chemistry, Le Chatelier's principle. So if you have an excess of formaldehyde, it pushes the reaction towards the polymer. And in the old days, they used an enormous uh, excess of formaldehyde, 50% to 250% more formaldehyde than they needed to cure the resin. Uh, so then that was emitted. And back in the 1950s, when they were using formulations like this, they had, um, and particle board was first starting to enter the market. Then they were building mobile homes. Back in those days, we called them trailers out of particle board. And the formaldehyde was being released interior in the interior of the mobile home. And the people were getting sick and the plants were dying and there was a big, um, it was a big deal. It was in the papers and on TV and that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> so eventually, so ever since, ever since people have been trying to reduce the amount of excess formaldehyde in the formulation and still get the reaction to go um, so that you get a decent adhesive bond. So today they're down one, 1.2. I think they're even lower than that. Um, I think some companies are even lower than that. You, you get lower by putting a scavenger in. So we have a scavenger that will, um, doesn't react as fast as the urea and it, then after the urea is done reacting, the scavenger is still reacting and it's still soaking up the formaldehyde. So, um, <clears throat> and there's probably other tricks too that there's, you know, I'm not privy to what goes on inside the adhesive manufacturing operation. So the major reason you have a formaldehyde issue with urea formaldehyde is because of the basic chemistry involved and that you need excess formaldehyde. There's also a minor issue, which is the, uh, due to what, we what I just talked about was the, uh, the reaction going backwards, being you can have the reaction go in reverse if you have enough water and the, <clears throat> then it will hydrate instead of condensate, right? Instead of condense, it will hydrate and it will go backwards and that will release formaldehyde. It'll go all the way back to urea and formaldehyde. It's reversible. Okay, so those are the issues with formaldehyde emissions and it's a big deal. And especially with the push for sustainability, 
Uh, this is one of the reasons that Kai Chung Lee, who used to be in this department, worked and to find a, worked hard and found a formulation based on uh, soybeans that was formaldehyde free. And now I believe the trade name for it is Pure Bond, and it's a big deal. It's being used mostly in interior plywood um, and Oh, maybe particle board, I'm not sure. But there's, um, he's got, he has a patent and he gets lots of money from the royalties, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a major product. And he's expanded into other areas too, replacing formaldehyde-based adhesives with non-formaldehyde-based adhesives. And he's not the only one. There are a number of people doing this um, but his has been successful, and I, there are others that are successful too. So for <clears throat> phenol formaldehyde, the advantages are because of the, and I think I mentioned this when we were doing the chemistry, because the uh, aromatic ring has a lower energy, it's more stable, the chemical bonds to it are stronger, then it does not have this issue of being reversible. It's pretty much, well, I suppose every reaction is reversible to some extent, but it's, <clears throat> the reverse reaction is so slow that um, it's really not an issue. So PF can be used outdoors. I don't recommend it, um, but I mean, it has exterior durability, right? But leaving wood outdoors without, with just wood and glue is not a great idea. It needs to be protected some other way. Paint at least, or sealer, or something. Uh, it has an intermediate cost between urea formaldehyde and isocyanate-based adhesives. And you can also make it as a powder. So the way they do that is they control the molecular weight. Remember, we're talking about making the polymers and controlling the molecular weight. And the molecular weight, actually at the, I'm not sure I mentioned this, all of these polymers and most glues, the, uh, it's unusual that you will have a, when you buy a package of glue, that it will be only the monomers. And then you just glue your thing together and it, and it cross links and does its thing. Usually there's some degree of polymerization. I think I did mention that. There's some degree of polymerization to control the viscosity, right? Well, with PF, what you can do here is you can partially polymerize it. So you're making probably oligomers. I don't, again, I don't know the secrets of the adhesive manufacturers, but you can make a polymer that's a low enough molecular weight that it will melt. So you can take a powder and you can sprinkle the powder on your, or spray the powder on whatever it is you want to bond and then put it in a hot press and the powder will melt and then you have the flow that you need, penetration that you need to get Van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, et cetera, et cetera. So you can make PF as a powder. Limitations are it's a dark color. Um, Americans don't seem to care too much about this, but it's a big deal in Europe. They don't like the dark color on the glue. Um, you're using PF for OSB. You have you only have moderate speed, so it takes longer than UF. It doesn't bond. It doesn't cure as rapidly as UF. And um, you also get some thickness swell. For PMDI, here you have rapid cure rates, low thickness swell because you get really good penetration. And it's a, again, it's colorless like UF. Um, so PMDI, if you leave it long enough, it will cure at room temperature. But people will generally run stuff through the hot press to get their production levels up because they don't want to, you know, sit there and wait while the adhesive cures. <clears throat> so also it has a low viscosity, so you get good penetration, you get lots of uh, flow and penetration. 
it's, it's an Exxon adhesive. The problem is it costs more. So whereas UF is down around 20 cents a pound or so, PF is around 50 cents a pound, PMDI is closer to a dollar, it's 90 cents a pound. And I haven't checked the price in the last year, so I don't know really what it's done in the last year or so. Another issue with PMDI, PMDI is that it's too good of an adhesive. It sticks to everything, right? So it requires release agents in the hot press uh, <clears throat> or on the call plates. So in order to prevent the wood from sticking. And also you need heated storage. Uh, you can't let it get too cold that precipitates out and makes a mess. So um, there are some limitations with PMDI, but it's an excellent adhesive. There's, we talked a little bit about this. So uh, RF and PRF are used for CLT, right? And they are, when we talk about the torsenol having a higher reactivity because it has two hydroxyl groups. <clears throat> so you get basically double activation of the aromatic ring. And so takes a little while, right? So when you folks make your CLT, you've got to put it in the press and leave it there for a while. Another one is polyvinyl acetate, which is white wood glue, Elmer's glue, right? And then melamine um, is a replacement for formaldehyde, uh, not formaldehyde, urea. You can use melamine instead of urea. It works just fine. Actually, you get, uh, you get good cross-linking. And it's actually more, because melamine is a aromatic compound, you actually get a better um, <clears throat> durability. So you get some ability to use it in exterior situations. Be careful with that. You can use epoxy with wood and it does work, it's just expensive. And you can use cyanoacrylates or super glue they generally don't work well. The viscosity is too low. Um, but I did have a woodworker tell me that you, if you mix the cyanoacrylate with a little sawdust, increase the viscosity, it works just fine. So, and I think that's it. Yes. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about adhesives. Now you've got all the information I wanted that I think you need about adhesives that you need in this amount of time. If you have questions or you want to learn more, get more involved in it, let me know. Uh, I've got plenty of textbooks and plenty of other videos and stuff. <clears throat> okay. So now, let's see. Will this work? Yeah. Start with composites. This. Have you ever thought about what a tree can do for the way we live, the environment, the planet? Too much of what we consume today is made from non-renewable materials. We can recycle some of them a few times, but we can't renew them. These materials contribute to global warming threatening growth, prosperity in our everyday lives. And consumers all over the world are demanding change. They want solutions that will help them take better care of the planet. Now, imagine that everything you bought came from material that is not only recyclable, but renewable. Regrown year after year, where the only gas that's emitted is pure breathable oxygen, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere instead of releasing it. Trees, we've been using them for ages. They keep us informed, they keep us warm, they keep us protected. And over time, we've innovated and made new discoveries. Trees, today, we can break the fibers down into tiny, tiny microfibrils and separate the components of wood. 
Tomorrow we'll be rebuilding them into new materials, like strong and light carbon fibers, that in turn can be turned into cars, planes, windmills. We'll even be replacing oil-based plastic bottles. Now, you might think that a plastic bottle is not a big deal, but you could build a tower to the moon with all the plastic bottles used in just one year. 25 times over. More people living in cities means more of those bottles. It means more food packages. It means more housing. Think about making all of these things with renewable materials. But not only that, we can make materials intelligent. Packages that tell us where they've been, where they are, what's inside, and if it's fresh. Soon, we'll see a range of new inventions pop up from all sorts of places. Transparent wood. Programmable wood that can change shape or form depending on the needs. Paper that can store energy and solar panels from trees. Trees can slow down global warming, but in order to do that, we have to take care of them, grow more than we harvest, and get the most from every fiber in every one. Have you ever thought about what a tree can do? We do, all the time. Stora Enso, the Renewable Materials Company. So oh, there's a promotional video from Stora Enso, one of the biggest uh, products companies in Finland. <clears throat> and I think some of that stuff's a little. One of the things we make from trees is composites. We're not the first one. King Tut's um, 3,000 year old casket here is, I don't know if that's a casket or just. Professor, we're still looking at the adhesion slides. We didn't get to see the video. No, no, we did see the video. We did get to oh, see the okay. video, um, but but we were just we were just looking at the last slide. That's all. All right. So it does. So Zoom does not change when I change. You see this now, King Tut's. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is uh, laminated, right? So it's got it's got veneer on it, and uh, three thousand years old. So composites, wood composites especially, are not new. <clears throat> so there's reasons that we want to make wood composites. Uh, waste material utilization, especially important for MDF and particle board. The one of the biggest reasons is to make things you can't make from logs. You can no longer, and I'm not sure you would ever want to, uh, make a solid piece of wood that's four feet by eight feet, right? To make a panel out of solid wood, it's just, <clears throat> it doesn't make sense. So uh, making sizes that are unavailable from logs. And also, uh, <clears throat> Composite theory, distribution of inhomogeneities, we'll be talking about that. And you can get better perform properties and performance from composites than you get from solid wood. You can also make it look good. Uh, you can get higher aesthetics with a lower cost. And by using a composite, for example, a if you have um, if you have indoor plywood that's got a very expensive and fancy tropical hardwood veneer on it, it can look great, but it will have, you don't have to make the whole thing out of tropical hardwood, right? So it gives you better value. Okay. 
Okay, so <clears throat> if you were uh, industrial engineers, the thing you would learn in when you were freshmen, industrial engineers, is that the manufacturing steps for making composites are material reduction, these three reactive application, and reconstitution. So this is true for wood, but it's true for other kinds of composites too. And issues with the uh, with composites or materials in general is to make them uniform, consistent, and predictable. And from the Wood Handbook here, it tells you you do this by making them smaller. So this is called comminution, or you comminute the wood. It means make it smaller. The word, I don't hear the word used much in the, in the wood business, but you hear it quite a bit in the mining business where they talk about mining ore and they comminute it before they process it. So it just means make it smaller. And there was one of the um, <clears throat> highly, highly noted professors from the Forest Products Lab, which is what FPL stands for down here. Was Roger Rao. He's retired, been retired for a number of years now. And um, he gave a lecture here in the predecessor class to this. And he said that his contention, he liked to be contentious. His contention was that wood's not a material because materials need to be uniform, consistent, and predictable. And wood is not. But if you go through this process of making a composite, the composite is a material. So you can make materials out of wood, but wood itself is not a material. I think he's probably the only person that would say that. <laughs> most people consider wood a material, but I think also most people, I mean, a lot of you are engineers, you don't really consider wood to be a really good material because it's got knots and it's highly variable, um, highly anisotropic. You've got different species with very different properties. So plus it burns, it rots. You know, it's my, my saying is that wood's the perfect material, except <clears throat> it burns, it rots, and it swells and shrinks with moisture. And also it's not uniform, consistent, and predictable. Reasons to make composites. So we go through the, to make a wood composite, you go through these steps, typically, use, there's a, there's all kinds of things going on. So <clears throat> uh, you take off the bark, you make it smaller, you dry it, you apply glue, you put it back together, cure the glue, and And these are some of the, these are classifications. So you, you can put the, try to put the different wood composites into these kinds of classifications. Probably you'll be able to find wood composites because there's so many different ones and new ones coming along all the time for specific applications. That <clears throat> you'll find things that don't fit in these, but these are some of the <clears throat> more common, right? Uh, classifications for wood composites. So of course CLT, that's what we're big on here at OSU. And veneers, well, you can you can read that, right? So it's the different, uh, and then wood non-wood composites is what I've done a lot of research on. So you have, the composites have their life cycle. So here's the life cycle of wood and the, um, plywood are over here past their peak and the uh, <clears throat> particle board OSB MDF are still growing. This slide's a little old. Probably here now. Uh, plastic lumber or wood plastic composites 
Uh, I think I think everything here has moved up <clears throat> the uh, moved up the curve except straw board. Straw board is still stuck down here, and there's other. Um, yeah, I think so. I think everything else has kind of moved up the curve. So I need to redo this. Uh, move on. So <clears throat> let's talk about composite theory. So how do we take wood, which is not a great material and turn it into a really good material? And lamination is one way, homogenization we wanna talk about. And the interface, which we talked about in adhesion, which means the interface between the glue and the wood, right? So we did a lot of that. You can model this. Um, there's lots of different kinds. So shear lag and material point are Dr. Nairn's specialties. He's also, um, I don't know, did you use, I don't know if you used his software for laminate theory. And then most people are familiar with finite element that gets done a lot. <clears throat> so, um, plywood is an example of laminated composite and so is carbon fiber epoxy. Um, <laughs> it's used for space shuttles and also laminated and they're laminated in different directions. Plywood's always laminated 0, 090, right? And uh, Dr. Nairn has shown that that is not the best orientation to use for plywood, but his um, attempts <clears throat> to get the plywood industry inter interested in doing something different than 0, 090 have fallen on deaf ears and he has They've, you know, they've spent billions of dollars getting their plants up and running based on 0, 090, and they don't want to go switching money. <clears throat> Even though it would give them better properties. Hopefully everybody's familiar with plywood 0, 090. And LVL and plywood, you've seen those in the lab, and then you have, uh, you can also take veneer laminated veneer. So it's just, there's so many different kinds of composites and so many more that can be made. The, um, the, uh, finding the best use of wood for a specific application is still an area, especially today, where you're can, looking to replace plastics and replace other non-renewable materials. Um, trying to find a wood composite that actually performs the very best in that particular application is still an area of active research and an area of active product development and commercialization. So. <clears throat> Another thing that people may not think about too much is like your countertop, it's a wood composite. It has an overlay on it. Typically, this is particle board. Some of you more expensive. Yeah, typically, it's particle board. And the particle board is shaped with the countertop. And then there is usually a melamine urea formaldehyde um, overlay that's put on it. Can be other things too. It doesn't have to be MUF, but uh, <clears throat> that's a typical one. So you have a wood non wood composite for your kitchen countertop. So this is repeating here, uniformity, consistency, and predictability, right? So we've seen this before. And now these slides come from uh, Dr. Mashinsky. So, but it's a way to demonstrate how you make a homogeneous and uniform material out of wood and um, the advantages of doing that. So 
he took three pieces of wood. So you've got three pieces of wood here. <clears throat> and what he did was he scanned them and he scanned them for color. So you could also scan them for strength, for modulus, for hardness, for whatever, depending on what your application is. But for purposes of just a class demonstration, he did it for color. And of course, the darker the color, the more of a knot you've got. And the knots are defects. So really what you're doing is trying to deal with the defects here. So he scanned it for color and he got board one, board two, and board three. And you can see that uh, board one had fairly consistent color, although it got a little bit darker in a few places. Board two and board three or wait, this is board one, board two, board three. And you can see that they all have different properties that are all variable and the defects um, are different in each one. So if you just take those three and you combine them, then you have board one here in orange. So you just take the boards and glue them together you get board one in orange, board, board two is in yellow, board three is down here, right? And the combined board is gonna have these properties. So board two, and this is, um, so <clears throat> this can be a little confusing. So here you have the property, right? And here you have distance along the board, property and distance. Now on this graph, you don't have distance. You have the different properties of the board and you have, so you sum up the different properties. You take a uh, distribution and bins and you put the numbers in the bins from the different distances. And so you have, <clears throat> for example, board two between 220 and 223 Board two had um, arbitrary units of 730 or so uh, units of property color in this point, color in this scheme, but it could be, like I said, it could be strength, stiffness, whatever. So the combined board then is <clears throat> just going to be um, the ones here in purple or blue, whatever your monitors show. So if we <clears throat> start again and we take the boards and we rip them, right? And then we place the boards so that the knots or the defects are more uniformly distributed. Yes, we've got some waste material, but that can be used in other composites, right? So we have the and so we distribute these things and then we make a, make a new board out of this, a glued together composite. But when you do that, you have, uh, so basically now you have a glue lamb and you still have, this is a uh, repetitive here of board one, board two, and board three, but now you have property that is uniform, consistent, and predictable, right? So that's the advantage of making things smaller and then putting them back together, which is how you make a composite. And by doing that, you distribute the defects and you get a more uniform and consistent and reproducible uh, board or product. <clears throat> so now, again, we're plotting properties down here on the x-axis, not distance. And here is the percent of the property that is available. So here's the combined board in the purple or blue. And the glue lamb board now in red is, you can see, much more consistent and also um, has much more of this property. This is the one you're after and you want the glue lamb board. So going back again, so we've got glue lamb and it's uniform and consistent. Now, if we plot it a different way here, 
So this is cumulative, right? So you have 190 start of your properties and they go up to 230. And again, it's color, but it could be stiffness or strength. And <clears throat> so you plot these then, here's board one and board two and board three, and you plot the properties <clears throat> and as a function of their distribution. So again, if we go back to, you see this one, if you did this, if you plot this cumulatively, you're gonna get very fast, a very fast rise. Here, you're gonna have a slow rise on the purple one, right? So here's the combined board, slow rise, goes up. Here's the glue land board, fast rise, and it goes up until you max out your properties. Right? And here's board one, two, three that we started with. Now, the thing about um, <clears throat> wood is because it's so variable, the engineers require that the uh, value of property that you use, example for strength or stiffness, be the fifth percentile. So this is the value that you have to use when you're designing um, a structure. <clears throat> now, if everything we did was board two, if we could cull out board two from the stack and throw away two thirds of the um, other boards, then we would have a much higher value here to use in our um, structure, whatever it was. So we could use less wood or the wood would be stronger or we'd have a longer span or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but in the, <clears throat> but if you compare the fifth percentile for the composite board compared to the combination board over here, you can see that you have a huge improvement in properties, right? So you go from 190 to 200, big improvement in properties. So it is this um, making the material more uniform also gives you with wood, if you do it right, it also <clears throat> spreads out the defects and gives you a higher average value. And then because of this fifth percentile limitation that's in the building codes and in the standards and in the specifications, um, <clears throat> then you have this huge advantage, right? Okay. So, some more arrows. <laughs> okay, so that is composite theory and homogenization and what it will do for you when you're making a wood composite. Any questions on composite theory? Hearing none. So I'm gonna quickly run through um, the different, um, some of the different materials or product or composite products. So one is plywood. Oh, and this may not work. I don't know if this is gonna work. Okay. Has everybody seen the video? Yes. Thanks. So you debark it, you make the logs, and then this is peeling the veneer. So the veneer, veneer gets peeled, it gets dried. Then of course you have to cut it. So you initially you cut it into four by eight sheets, but you have to laminate it, right? So one has to go crossways. So you need to cut that and uh,
And also they use, the, it said scarf joining. They basically, they take the things that aren't the right size and glue them together. Making composite, you always want to remove um, some material from the edge because you have edge effects. You're weaker at the edges. Nice robot there. Okay, so that's one, and then this one is, I think it's shorter. <clears throat> I was trying to find, uh, so really the heart of making plywood is the veneers, is, is peeling the veneer, and it's hard to find a video that actually shows that, and I think this one may show Hard to see no matter what. So, so you see it spinning. So then it rolls on the rollers. You see it getting smaller. There's a knife underneath, right? And there's the veneer coming out. So I'll have to ask, uh, I'll have to ask Scott when he does, you know, if you want to see this for real, uh, you can sit in on 465, probably not this year. <laughs> I think this year, a lot of the uh, mill visits, so 465 is, of course, an undergraduate course, but it's our course where the students spend a week, five days uh, visiting mills, usually 15 to 17 different mills or uh, <clears throat> different kinds of wood operations. And the so then you can really, you get a chance to really see and watch the veneer in operation and, you know, all the different types of wood manufacturing in operation. It's a good thing to do. So, and so these are some of the, for all of, so I'm just kind of uh, blasting through these different composites that I think you're probably familiar with but you may not be all that familiar with the advantages and disadvantages. So the, <clears throat> these are some of the advantages, right? And plywood can be treated, preservatives and fire retardants, um, which is not true of some of the other <clears throat> composites, right? So it can be decorative plywood, right? So it can be hardwood plywood, and we have, um, Oregon is big on plywood. We make lots of plywood here. And we have a couple of different hardwood plywood mills uh, close by, <clears throat> two in Eugene actually. And so they make, they make the high priced decorative, uh, what I mentioned before, the plywood with a very expensive, one layer, a very expensive veneer and we were visiting the mill once and they said that one layer of veneer, four by eight uh, panel of plywood, hardwood plywood, one, the one piece of veneer that was less than a 10th of an inch thick would be over a hundred dollars. So, but it was gorgeous, right? And usually they have a finishing operations with it. Uh, so they will coat it 
<clears throat> the ones I've seen are urethane that are cured with uh, ultraviolet light, but there's lots of different ways to do things. So disadvantages, the, ven the veneer is expensive compared to Depends on that, your application. You know, you don't want to use plywood where LVL would be a better choice. It would be better properties. So OSB, OSB is generally not uh, made here. Uh, we don't have any wood that is low cost. T.P.'s Allendale Mill is one of the largest and most sophisticated in the world. After harvest, trees are hauled to the mill's wood yard, unloaded by two massive overhead cranes and stacked in the Allendale yard. Some 100 trucks make this journey to quality every day. Your OSP will come from one just like that. The log is marked. Every piece of the log is used. Nothing is left behind. By the way, GP recycles the bark as fuel. Then it heads for the strander, where it is precision cut in a ring holding 48 knife assemblies surging at over 2,000 RPMs. We control the strand thickness, width, and length to achieve the right properties for every product we produce. After being sifted and separated in 20,000 cubic foot wet bins, strands are conveyed to massive dryer. Over 100 feet long, they are capable of drying up to 235,000 pounds per hour at 800 degrees. That's enough OSD to cover six football games. The two things you need to know while we're here. One, we've said it before, but every part of the law is used. And two, state-of-the-art environmental controls help keep the air clean. That says it all. After drying, the strands are blended with resins and wax. Here, we use special formulations to produce our moisture-resistant subflooring products like DryGuard with its 180-day no-sand guarantee and DryMax with its 300-day no-sand guarantee. From blending, the strands travel to the forming line. Our line uses up to six forming heads, allowing us much greater flexibility and capability in how we produce our products. Many other OSB mills have only four. Resin and forming help determine a board's properties. What most folks don't realize is there is a tremendous amount of wood in every finished board. You see that tall mat of wood strands here? It will end up in one strong and resilient 7 16th inch finished board. That happens at our massive press, which weighs over 2 million pounds and is almost 15 stories tall. Here, the mats are pressed using up to 7,500 PSI and at over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The process is highly impressive and also highly controlled from a computerized control room that oversees every step in the process, from stranding, blending, and forming to the environmental system. In our quality assurance lab, our OSB is subjected to load deflection, linear expansion, and a dozen other tests to ensure that it not only meets or exceeds industry specifications, but it meets GP's high standards too. Further product differentiation takes place in the finishing stage. Here, our thermostat radiant barrier sheet gets its aluminum foil overlay laminated to the board. This foil can keep up to 97% of the sun's radiant heat from penetrating into the attic if you have thermostat radiant barrier sheathing on your roof. But by now, the panels have cooled and are cut to size, grade stamped, stacked in bundles, certified for quality, painted, and ready to be shipped. All right, so that's OSB. And uh, hmm, pretty impressive mill there. It's in the southeast, so they use probably, I don't know, but they're probably using southern pine, some, kind, some species of southern pine. Um, which is less expensive. You saw that the uh, the trees there, the logs were were 
by Oregon standards, puny, right? They were they were small. They were fence posts by Oregon standards. So um, <clears throat> cheaper, yeah. So that's OSP, and so the advantages are it's less expensive than plywood, and you know they were talking about their 300-day uh, no sand guarantee. I'm pretty sure what that means is if it gets wet, they're going to guarantee it for 300 days. If it gets wet, it won't swell. So one of the problems, if you, hey, these are advantages, so we'll wait. So OSB is definitely less expensive than plywood, and it's just strong and stiff because the flakes are oriented when they when they make OSB, it didn't show this much in the video, when they make OSB, the flakes are moved into position uh, on the belt by coming down, uh, uh, they put them in, they put them on another belt and it vibrates and the vibration brings it, <clears throat> uh, moves the flakes downhill. It's also uh, oriented. So they move, the flakes get vibrated going downhill and then they fall on the mat and then the mat is the thing that takes it to the call plates that puts it in the hot press. So they have, um, <clears throat> they have these vibrating uh, belts <clears throat> that form the mat that are in different directions. So you have one coming in at 90 degrees and one, one in the same direction as the belt that goes into the uh, hot press. Mm. It doesn't actually go into the hot press, but you know what I mean. And <clears throat> so that's how they orient the flakes. So like plywood, OSB is oriented and it can be controlled, right? So um, it is, um, <clears throat> so you have, so you can, so you orient the flakes and you get this similar, maybe not exact, but similar properties in different in the two different directions. And then compared to MDF, fiberboard is lighter, it's cheaper, but it's also weaker. And that depends to some extent on the amount of glue that you use. And glue is always uh, one of the more expensive components in the composite. Advantages, um, aspen. So a lot of OSB is made in Canada, and they've got a lot of aspen trees in Canada. And they used to have a lot in the North U.S. I think a lot of them are cut down now, but they, uh, I think they still have them. So you see aspen for OSB, and southern pine is used a lot for OSB. Aspen will rot just when you look at. And you got to be careful about OSB rotting. And one of the things that um, makes me cringe is going around Corvallis in the winter time when it's raining and you see people building buildings and they're using OSB for the sheathing and it's just soaking wet. And that's because uh, it swells, right? I suppose unless you have GP 300 here and Grimax 300 guaranteed for 300 days. Well, yeah, guaranteed. Uh, it's already on the building. So, you know, what are they going to do? The, um, <clears throat> but you do get the wood gets wet, the wood swells. If you put enough wax in the system, put enough wax in the glue, uh, then you can, yes, you can get some water repellency, right? This is also true with MBF. And, and particle board. They all put wax in the in with the glue. Um, if you're using, uh, you can get OSB with using uh, phenol formaldehyde as the glue, and then you can see the dark blue on the surface, uh, or you can use UF and PMDI. So UF is used quite a bit. Um, and because it swells and you can't treat it with water and you really can't even treat it with oil-borne treatments either, uh, it just makes a mess, right? It doesn't really soak up. 
it's not absorbed well, I should say. Okay, particle board. So here we have some interesting things going on with particle board. So you can, with particle board, you can vary the properties, right? So depending upon the press closure rate, moisture content, the amount of resin, uh, you can vary the, the properties. So there's a lot of variables in making particle board that can give you different properties of the particle board. <clears throat> so if you have a higher moisture content on the, on the face, right? So typically with particle board, you'll have coarser particles on the interior and you'll have Call it interior exterior, they call it core and face. So generally the core, so this is a profile, right? CL is the center line. So this is the middle of the board. So you're taking a board, you're cutting it, and you're looking at the cut surface. <clears throat> so here is it's a half an inch thick. And so here's the middle of the board, and it's so it's half an inch thick, and you're looking at um, quarter of an inch in either direction from the middle. It's fairly symmetrical. And then in this case, we're looking at specific gravity. So what you have here is um, if you have a higher moisture content, you can get a higher density. Why? Because the water can, to some extent, plasticize the wood, right? Wet wood's a little easier to squish than dry wood. So if you have a higher moisture content, you're going to have some steam. And when you close the hot press and that steam can, uh, if it's higher than the glass transition to mature of the lignin, then you can, plastic, you can plasticize it. Or even if it isn't, you still, with steam, you can, um, even a little bit of steam, it will bend better so that you'll have, uh, as the press closes, if you have a higher moisture content, you can get a higher density at the edge. Well, when you do this, remember now we're looking at, this is a little strange. So we're looking at the, uh, so, geez. We're looking at a piece of particle board like this, and we're scanning across it this way, right? So you're looking at, here's the edge, here's the edge, here's the edge, here's the edge, and here's the center, and there's the center, right? So you're scanning here. So if you have a higher density here, and a higher density here, and the main the main forces involved in the application, like a floor or a roof, <clears throat> are in flexure, then you're going to have better properties, right? Okay. Um, So, you can get something similar simply by changing the rate at which you close the press. So, if, you, if your target density is 45 pounds per cubic foot PCF, and you have a relatively quick press closure, then <clears throat> as the press closes, if it's closing fast, then the, again, it's kind of similar to relaxation time that we were talking about with polymers. There's some sort of connection there. So the wood doesn't have time to really move around, right? So as you, if you press it quickly, you can get a higher density on the face and a lower density in the core. If you have a slow press closure, 
Now things have time to move, and so you get a more uniform density. So by controlling the closure speed of the press, you can get different properties to, and different specifications for your final particle board product. So particle board was originally born back in around the 1950s <clears throat> when people had um, TP burners. Does everybody remember TP burners? There's a TP burner over in uh, Philoma. The TP burners were, oh, I'm such a bad artist. They looked like big badminton birdies, right? And a person would be about maybe this big. Whoa, that's arms in the wrong place. <laughs> and typically at the top, that was they just had a screen. Right? With smoke coming out. <clears throat> And those were called TP, there's, there people call them different names. Back in Missouri, we called them TP. When I was growing up, we called them TP burns. People objected to the smoke. And besides that, people started, while well, they were objecting to the smoke and people started thinking, well, we're burning this wood and we're just, we're just burning it, right? It's like flaring off the biogas instead of using it. So we're just burning this wood to no point just to, because, well, when I was a kid, my favorite toy was actually my grandfather's sawdust pile. So he had a lumber mill, a little bitty one, and um, in a little bitty town in the Ozarks in Missouri. <clears throat> but the sawdust pile was, I don't know, it was I don't know, 50 to 100 yards in diameter. And it, was made, it seemed like it was hugely tall. It was probably 30 feet tall or something like that. And so it was our mountain. We would climb on it and jump off of the cliff and all kinds of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it was a great place to play when we were a kid. The sawdust pile caught fire and burned for years and years and years because the sawdust will just pump, right? It will just slowly smolder. And uh, finally went out and the the lumber mill's gone, the lumber yard's gone, the sawdust pile is gone. It's all gone now. It's apartments, I think. <clears throat> so anyway, back in the 1950s, they had these kinds of burners. And the, uh, so they started thinking about what they could do with the, with the sawdust besides just burning it. And they came up with particle board. And it was a big hit. So as low cost, um, as we, so we've been saying, you can control the density within limits. You can also add dry components, such as dyes, pigments, fire retardants. Um, you can't really treat it with preservatives. You could add some powdered preservative, but it probably wouldn't work very well. The bugs would just go right around the powder. <clears throat> So it typically does not get treated. Disadvantages, anybody who's built bookshelves using concrete blocks and plywood boards knows that it is weak <laughs> and uh, you can't use it in exterior uses because when it gets wet, it swells and loses its properties. Um, Glue is visible, so UF is often used. I talked about UF in the in particle board in the 1950s and formaldehyde. Severe thickness swell, so it'll swell and it won't go back. You're done. Once it gets wet, it swells and it might it might go back a little bit when it dries, but <clears throat> it's not no longer useful. So you can't really treat it. Lamb beams. Uh, again, we talked about this with uh, when we 
we're talking about homogenization. And when you make Lulam beams, the best way to do it is to make is to put the best lumber on the outside right, in the core uh, because you have the uh, neutral axis in the core, then you can use uh, lumber with knots and things in it in the core. And in the early days, they would uh, <clears throat> they would put the good lumber on one side, right? Because in glue lamb, if you're using it, and if the forces involved in the application are in flexure, then the top's in compression. So no problem, right? The bottom is in tension, so that's where you want the good boards. So that bottom couple of boards would be uh, really high quality, and the rest would be, the middle would be low quality, and then the top would be medium quality. And then they would, they would stamp it, and they would say this side up, right, on the top. And then <clears throat> they started selling these things, and they went in and looked, and when they looked up at the ceiling, they could read this side, but side up on the bottom of the glue lamp beam. So now they put <clears throat> high quality on both sides. It's idiot proofing the, uh, the product. And then you can have This is LVL. Hopefully everybody's familiar with LVL. So it's like plywood, but it's in, all the veneers are in the same direction. And it's all zero, zero, zero. And so you get really high properties as I think you saw in the lab, <clears throat> um, if you've watched the video yet. So you can get really high properties in the one direction and really low properties in the transverse direction. So LVL. And then there's all kinds of different variations. So instead of OSB, you can have OSL. So um, instead of making a four by eight sheet out of the strands, you can orient them all in the same direction and make a board. And so then you get OSL, or in the strand lumber. You have Paralam, which is made out of wood cut into uh, things that kind of look like popsicle sticks, right? And you, have, you can use strands um, <clears throat> so that you can, there's just all kinds of different um, operations. And you can have I-beams also. So the I-beams generally have LVL flanges and OSB webs. And it's a real interesting, uh, they make the station up by uh, It's a real interesting operation to look at go there and visit. So um, you see they've got a notch, right? So the web notches into the flange. It's glued, it's glued at top and bottom. Uh, and there are machines that just put these things together. It's pretty cool. Usually they will uh, chamfer a little bit on the edges here to make it slide in easier. And you can use PF, it's not very visible. <clears throat> but now you have something that is very strong So glue lamb, um, you can make glue lamb beams as long as you want because you can finger join them and the, so they can be enormously long. You can also make them curved. So you can do all sorts of things. As, as time goes by, people figure out better ways to do things. And you can reinforce them with Kevlar or carbon fiber. Um, a lot of the qualification for that was done here at OSU. 
way back in the 90s. Um, and glue lamb can be treated. It's just lumber that's glued together. So uh, you can treat it like you treat lumber. It's, um, and if you have the, the Kevlar and the carbon fiber, you don't put it between every lamb, between every board. You put it between uh, the outside and the next to outside board. So you put it as close as you, as you can to where the maximum stress is going to be. So making uh, glue lamb, the problems you have like CLT, it's difficult to heat the interior of the beam. So using cheap glue gets problematic. Because of that, you have to come up with expensive ways like microwaves to cure it, or you use a more expensive glue like PRF, RF, something like that. <clears throat> and you have to lay it up, and um, so that can add to the processing cost. Right? It's not a pain of process. So, fiberboard. Cardboard and MDF insulation board. The things that make this different are simply the density. And the things that make the density different is the press. How, uh, how compressed you make the fiber. So you put the fiber in the press and it's, um, and here you can see some, I'm not sure. I thought this was a video. Yeah, there it is. Soft woods can now be processed to make MDF and HDF, that's medium density and high density fiberboard, an improved wood product suitable for furniture making. These logs are being debarked in the first stage of the process. Next, they're hacked into chips in a giant blender. The chips are graded and washed to remove impurities. Then they're blasted with steam and mixed with resin. Once they've been dried again, they're formed into a giant continuous fibre mat. This mat goes through a hot press, 260 degrees Celsius to be exact. The press squashes it into 1 40th of its original thickness. The result is a wood panel board of consistent quality. In other words, there are no knots or splinters. The cut sheets are cooled on a giant wheel before being packed. Okay. <clears throat> so again, that's uh, the press closure distance is what determines the density of these things, assuming that you have the same amount of, you know, you can vary the amount of fiber that you put in and you vary the, the press closure distance and uh, you get the different density board, and the different densities of the different boards, MDF, hardboard, insulation board. Right. <clears throat> so nice stuff, more expensive than particle board, uh, but it, it's used a lot with furniture. Uh, one of the big advantages there is because you have such a nice surface because you have, so, you have fibers now instead of particle. So you get a nice smooth surface. And a lot of times, depending on what you're making, you don't even have to sand it. So then you eliminate one operation in your if you're making furniture, right? You eliminate one operation. So that saves you money. So you can afford to use a higher, a more expensive board. Um, in the beginning, <clears throat> MDF or fiberboard was made without glue. So if you glue it, um, if you press it wet, once again, you can plasticize the wood and it will <clears throat> um, bond to itself. But the problem with that was it still had water in it and you took the water out during the process, right? Because you can't sell it wet. You have to have the fiberboard gets sold dry. So you had a water effluent and that water effluent 
contained all kinds of extractives and glue and nasty stuff. So it became a, uh, the environmental, as time went by, the environmental costs got higher and higher. And to my knowledge, there aren't any wet process MDF plants in this country. Okay. <clears throat> so you can glue it with <clears throat> white wood glue. You can powder coat it. So powder coating is, um, you take a, you take, it's a way to, basically it's paint, but it's, a co it's more, than, more than paint, it's a coating. You take a powder and you put it through an electric discharge so it picks up a, a charge and you put the opposite charge on the thing that you want to coat and the, then the powder is attracted to the opposite charge and you do this whole thing at a high enough temperature that the powder melts on the substrate and then it uh, uh, as it melts of course it diffuses into each other so you have the diffusion mechanism basically of adhesion between the between the powder particles and then you get a really strong with doing this technique you can make a really strong and stiff and durable coating and this is the kind of coating that you have on your oven, um, your stove, your refrigerator, right? And there's a lot of things these days that are powder coated. And for a long time, it wasn't possible to powder, powder coat wood, but now they figured out how to do it. So you can powder coat MDF. And compared to particle board, you have much greater dimensional stability. Um, disadvantages. So it's higher costs. We talked about that already. It's stronger than OSB. So if you're using UF then uh, as your glue, then you can get issues with formaldehyde, right? Um, and the fibers are small, so when you when you're processing, when you're using tools with it, you get small fibers um, coming off so that you need ventilation and placing on the system. So it's more irritating. <clears throat> and <clears throat> importantly, because the fibers are so small, in order to get them to stick together, you need to use more glue than you do with particle board. It's something like three to four times as much glue. And so typically the glue is the most expensive component in the fiber board. Hmm. So that's what makes it expensive then. Um, and you got to be a little bit careful. If you get too close to the edge, uh, and I have, right? <laughs> if you get too close to the edge, it can split and uh, be a problem. Okay. So I'm out of time and we're just up to CLT. So, um, Hopefully everybody's familiar with CLT because, and I think CLT is the end. The only the other thing was there are standards for all these things. Um, and there are other natural fiber composites, straw, jute, canaf, sisal, hemp, corn, blah, blah, blah. And all of these things are used. All composites are made out of them. Um, one of the things I found recently was a hemp board. So there's a company that makes hemp boards and you can build your house out of a hemp board if you like. Um, <clears throat> you can also make fancy stuff here like the honeycomb, balsa wood honeycomb. I think I've mentioned that already. Okay, so I hope people weren't expecting, I think you probably get CLT coming up in other classes in your curriculum. So if anybody's really upset that <clears throat> then they want to talk to me about CLT, um, you'll all be back week after next. And um, at least I think if I interpret the new rules correctly, you'll be back. I suppose it's up to Eric and uh, Anthony as to when um, 
actually will be allowed to start doing research again. But I said, <clears throat> according to what I read, it looks like June the 14th, at least some of us will be able to come back and start research. And won't that be great? <clears throat> so um, any questions? No questions? No questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving for two o'clock. So we'll get back to uh, optionally, optional two o'clock review session. So if you want to come, uh, come. If you want to come for a few minutes and it's not helpful, then, you know, it's totally optional. And um, I will see you then at two o'clock. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Have Professor. Thank you, Professor. See you this afternoon. See you this afternoon. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye.